Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session, a very English uh, scandal. Um, just to start, I'm going to let you know how we're going to roll. We're going to chat for about 50 minutes, and then the final 10 minutes, we're going to open the floor up uh, for questions. The festival app may or may not be working. If it isn't working, we'll uh, send some people with mics. If they don't work, we'll go for semaphore. And if that doesn't work, we'll work like the ancients did and go for cave paintings and hieroglyphs. Um, hands up who saw a very English scandal. Uh, good, a goodly proportion. Uh, to my mind, the best drama on TV this year. It managed to be contemporary and yet, of course, was a period piece. It was incredibly joyful and rumbustuous and yet was very sensitive towards the heart of the story, which is essentially about the corruption of power and the abuse of an innocent individual. And uh, I think most arrestingly, it brought back Vaseline into the public consciousness. <laughs> Uh, for those who didn't see it, that tiny, tiny minority, uh, here's a clip to let you know what you missed out on. Are you all right? He tried to shoot me! Who did? <laughs> Jeremy Thorpe! Jeremy Thorpe did this! It was Jeremy Thorpe! Mr. Jeremy Thorpe, you're the youngest man to lead a British political party in more than a century. It is my duty to enrich our lives for generations to come. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Be careful now, because I'm not sure any boy's worth ending up in prison for. I can't. Why not? It's wrong. Well, that's not wrong. He's perfected the art of hiding in plain sight. I'm left on my own all day. What am I supposed to do? Well, maybe it's time you thought about moving on, Norman. I'm going to tell you about my homosexual relations with Jeremy Thorpe. You will destroy me and the party and my marriage. I will be heard and I will be seen. There is only one way for us to survive. Norman Scott has got to die. Jeremy says kill him in America. So I thought Florida. Shoot him dead, chuck him in a swamp, gone. David, you don't really want to do this, do you? Oh, my God, no. I'm so glad. It's bloody nuts. Feels like man can trust his kind. Mr. Scott, you're in very great danger. He says someone wants to kill me. Why have you changed your shirt? He's very good looking. I'm arresting you for conspiracy to murder Norman Scott. This night at Thorpe's mother's was the start of a homosexual relationship. I can't believe they can say this on the BBC. I was rude. I was queer. Silence! I was myself. the story of a liar meeting a fantasist. But I'm not sure which one's which. To Her Majesty. Her Majesty. In a world that we can be what we say. Please welcome to the stage the executive producer Dominic Trobel Collins, the writer Russell T. Davis, the actor Hugh Grant, Stephen Free, the director of Dan Winch, the producer! <laughs> Morning all. Can I ask where this first began? What was, what was the first idea that precipitated this masterpiece? Um, Blueprint had bought the book, John Preston's book, yeah. A Very English Scandal, um, and I sent it to Russell straight away. He said, I'm far too busy. <laughs> you <And> tease. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you emailed me two days later and said, you yeah, bugger. I cheated because I said I'm too busy and... He said, never mind, I'll send it to you anyway. And it sat on my desk like a radioactive thing, glowing. Because I'd, I'd always been fascinated by that story. And I read about two pages and just went, yes, I'm in, all right, yes, 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 yes. Is that all it took, two pages? Well, he sat there going, we'll get you Stephen Frears, we'll get you Hugh Grant. I was like, yeah. It'd Did you really have? In the end, we all know <laughs> Did you really have those two in play yeah. at that time? When, you re when I first read the book, it was Hugh. Like, it, was <laughs> Hugh. it was definitely Hugh. And then, Stephen, you sat next to Andrea Wong at a dinner. And she said to you, oh, we're doing an English scandal. You said, I want, I've, I've read the book, hadn't you? No, I hadn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I thought I'd read the book. Have you now read the book, Stephen? <laughs> Is it now? I've now read, I think, I, yes, I read the book. <laughs> and the script, made the film. But this is the first, am I right, it's about f your first venture back into television for five years, something like that? No, what year did we do the deal? 
1783. I don't know. We ha- not since the deal. <laughs> Check back 10, 10, 15. Yeah. Okay. So, though, so what, what, what was it about this story that brought you back? Well, it was good. It was good. <laughs> what, what else is there? But the, it's presumably, for you, Hugh, kind of hard to take on board uh, not only a, a politician who was very beloved, but also it's such recent history, everyone has a take on him. And I assume you don't want to just do an impression. How do you actually inhabit a real-life character who everyone has a take on? Well, uh, I, I have absolutely no idea. I, I panicked. <laughs> I, I watched uh, YouTube, and there he is, lots of him. Yeah. And then I found that I could do quite a good imitation of him. And then I thought, fuck, I can't just do an imitation because Ben Wishaw will be doing proper acting. <laughs> <laughs> so... I then went through the, you know, the whole actively process of uh, who is he and where did he come from and all, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. And then, uh, yeah, and then just did an imitation, really. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not quite true because you, you really inhabited him. I and mean, we've got a clip that shows you genuinely having even learned to play the violin as he did. We've got a clip. Oh. This is the true immersion. I wouldn't have chosen that clip. Come on. <laughs> who might this be? Ursula, this is Peter Freeman. He's a cameraman. He's coming with me on that expedition to Malta. I said we could give him a bed for the night. Hmm? Five, six, seven, eight. There was a lot of giddy trilling in that. Was that all you? A lot of what? Giddy trilling in that piece. Was, did, were you doing all that? Was that all you? Uh, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a hand double who, who was... Uh, the, the, the hand shot uh, was my coach, who was a very nice French violinist, who used to come with his girlfriend and what they alternated for months and taught me, and I was increasingly desperate and angry. In fact, so much so that they've now divorced. Uh, <laughs> that's one nice thing to come out of this whole thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah any violinist who sees that winces horribly in fact and of course it's you're, you've collaborated before was it important for you Stephen that Hugh was involved in, in, in this production did well, you immediately it, know I, that he was the guy I think so yes I did I mean it wasn't important that he was involved in the, it was just he was the right casting so it was in that absolutely straightforward way that he that I went to see him. But I was I I demurred only because I mean I thought it was brilliant and I hate everything everything, um, but I could see it was brilliant. And I I was thirty years too old for the part, <laughs> and I did. We had a lunch where I fussed about that a bit, yeah. didn't I? Uh, you know, at the beginning of the series, he's thirty and I'm fifty-seven, so uh, that is slightly ludicrous. But luckily, very few people have minded. Nobody's... No, you've completely got away with it. Nobody's yeah. noticed. And it's not been for you to make that. And Dan- you, you sorry. also got um, Daniel Phillips, who was the makeup man on uh, Florence Foster Jenkins as well. That was part of your, your, your deal. <laughs> I stamped my little foot about that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Since then, I've met hundreds of actors who wanted to play the part. Rupert Everett won't ever speak to me again. <laughs> yeah. Stephen Mangan said he rang the BBC up the day Thorpe died and said, well, now can we do it? <laughs> and Dan, what was it like for you? I and mean, obviously there's some, you have some heavyweight brilliance in, in this gang. Mm. What was it like sort of wrangling? Were there, were there egos aplenty? Were there strong opinions? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think what uh, made it yeah. differ in comparison with other, with other projects, yes, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it meant, uh, I guess, that the conversations were much more um, out there. You know, there was, there, it, was, it was great that everyone was talking all the time, 
um, rather than sitting on any uh, any thoughts. You know, that, that was something we had right through prep. I'm being very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> very, that was an exercise yeah. to me. <laughs> and how hard was it for you, Russell? Obviously, you, you've... Did you finish reading the book? You said you read the first two pages and you were in. Yes, I did. Yeah. But, but <laughs> I the didn't more, read the rest. presumably, you read, the more you're invested in that particular uh, rendering of the story. Yes, we kind of found, I think we all find, felt, I mean, they're real people. That, that kind of hits you with an enormous responsibility, and, and their children are still alive. So, although it's fun and exciting to make a show to get a commission, it's, it, that's unusual for me. I've never had that kind of weight of responsibility mm. before. So we all, uh, you, I mean, Delic, the script editor, did, we kind of read everything, not just the John Preston, but I know you read a lot of stuff as well. There's a lot of stuff to read to really kind of immerse yourself in it, to be fair to it, really. I think, I think, I think the most important thing was, I felt coming to it that there's an awful lot of books and an awful lot of research. I felt very much like it was, the, in my opinion, it was the first time the story was going to be told by a gay man. And these were gay men, or Jeremy Hope was bisexual, or whatever you want to call him, but um, it's a very gay story. And um, I kind of felt that's what I was there for. I thought, well, that's why I've been hired, is to bring that sensibility and whatever I might think I know to that, and, and to understand these men. That's the point, that's what the point I'm trying to make, is that there's a million facts and a million books, but they're all written by journalists, which is kind of a different slant on, yeah. on, on, on interpretation. And I thought, well, I'm here to understand why they did these things why they were so mad, why they were so in love, why they were so out of love, and why they were so angry. And, I, you know, that's, I love that. That's my job in the end. And because, as you say, there were relatives still living and the story still sort of relatively fresh in the sort of public consciousness for people of a certain age, yeah. um, presumably there's a duty of care that you all had to have that was way in excess of, you know, other productions that you've been involved in. A sort of, yeah, a caution maybe that, that sort of came to play. Yeah, I think that carried through with all our heads of department, all the departments across the board, actually, from the very early meetings that we had with... Um, we went down to see Norman yeah. um, in, his, uh, in his cottage, um, just outside Exeter, so he's down, still in that part of the world. And, uh, you know, that was incredibly memorable. The, the lunch we had with Rupert Thorpe, um, Jeremy's son... Paul was Bessel, extremely, I mean, a, Peter yes, of course. Sad. The real Diana yeah. Stainton, the actual secretary, who we had lunch with, we loved her. Yeah. She lives in Turkey. It's interesting because you want to meet them and be diligent and have respect, but you're not there to be beholden to them either. No. no. Uh, it, it's a tricky balance. It's, it's like mm. you, we had to sit with them also and say, we're not telling your story. We're not telling your version of the story. We will have our own version. And so you've got to respect that. So it was, which was fine as a yeah. process, wasn't it? It was interesting. And we spent a lot of time with Norman, who's amazing, who is an amazing character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think as well, what I think is quite nice with, with this is we, we took Norman, we took the episodes down to show Norman and sat there really nervously, yeah, didn't yeah, we, yeah. in his living room. And that was surreal for us to watch a real person watching their life back. Mm. And Because I think the thing about Norman is, is that when you read the books, or when you read, or if you just look on Wikipedia and research the history of the case, he's a mystery. Because this was yes. the 60s and 70s, he's a mystery. Why did he do this? Why did he do that? How did he act in this manner? What was the appeal? It's now 2018. When you meet Norman, you go, oh, hello, you're a gay man. I completely get that. You're not a mystery anymore, actually. The, because it's, it's the like... Jeremy Thorpe scandal. It's Jeremy always that you hear about. Yeah. And, and Norman, as you say, has been a very shadowy figure up to her. So was it for you as simple as that? It was, now I understand. It's a, simply, it's a story of a man who fell in love with a powerful guy. To be honest, and from, was, from a know. normal side, the moment I met him, I just went, oh, I've met you before. <laughs> it's, like, you're, it's like, you're my friend Peter, you're my friend Derek, you're my, I, just, I get it. And, and, and yes, yeah, I, I kind of, and you wanted to do him justice. That was the thing. And what was it like for he, you, Hugh, when you had members like Rupert Thorpe kind of wanting to be, not necessarily involved in the production, but keen to find out what was going on and obviously how Jeremy was going to be portrayed? Was that difficult? Well, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, I don't know how interested he was, actually. I was... They, you all went and had lunch with him. Yeah. You know, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I uh, shied at that fence. Um, I don't know why. I, I was frightened of him. Someone told me he was a paparazzo. That, that they've never really been my cup of tea. <laughs> so... <laughs> I skipped him. But I did meet thousands of other ex-colleagues and friends of Thorpe. And one of the amazing things was just the diversity of opinion about him, mm. from people saying, 
darling, he was the nicest man you have ever met in your life. He would never have hurt a flea. This thing about him being plotting to murder is preposterous. To others saying, oh, no, 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 no. Very dark and terrifying monster. And where do you fall between those two poles? Uh, you know, inhabiting his character, where do, you, where do you think he sits? Well, I think that uh, he was both and some of the things in between. And I, I always think we, we all are. I mean perhaps without the murdering bit, but uh, <laughs> I've always thought, I'm certainly not one person, I'm about six, depending on mood, environment, hangover, whatever, and, uh, and I think that's how he was too, and there was a, uh, there was a, for instance, a, definitely a charming Thorpe, there was a very loving family man Thorpe, and I, that, for me that was always crucial in this thing, that he, although we have a scene where I, uh, Thorpe admits he's only getting married the first time to sort of boost himself in the p polls as liberal leader. He did fall in love with his first wife and was brokenhearted when she was killed and he loved his son and then he really loved his second wife, Marion. And uh, that was key because uh, amongst all the other reasons for wanting to murder Norman, like don't fuck with my career, you know, I'm this great narcissus and, and I'm rising up the, 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 the greasy pole in Westminster and all that. Uh, apart from those reasons, there was also don't come anywhere near my family and my mm. kid. Um, and that, that I could grab onto. You know, it's, it's the middle class man coming down the stairs in the middle of the night with a, a Caesar burglar and reaches for the cricket bat and yeah. suddenly becomes a caveman. And that was quite important to be able to say with conviction, well, we have to kill him. Yeah, it comes very clear cut when it's about you know yeah. protecting his family yeah. and his nearest. And yeah. I think that was handled really, really brilliantly um, tonally. That the fact that you can simultaneously be indulging in same-sex relationships, which at the time were obviously very covert and illegal, and you know had that sort of exciting kind of illicit vibe to them, whilst being a family man and loving you know your family, yeah. your wife, your your, your son. Um, so is it true that the, the the former secretary came on set? That, the, that, that she... Yeah, she did, yeah. yeah. She rocked up. She, it, we were, it was day two of filming and we were, um, we were at the house. It was Jeremy's second house, so where he moved to when he married Marion. Mm. So it was actually Marion's house just along uh, Bayswater, wasn't it? And, uh, and so it's day two and we were, we were doing the balcony scene. So it was actually the end of episode three um, with, uh, you know, post the, the trial on the balcony with everybody. And... Uh, um, this lady came with her kids, she was actually with her carer, and uh, we didn't know that, we hadn't, weren't expecting her, we didn't know she was going to turn up, but we'd let her drop the area, as we do when we're filming, to say we're going to be turning up. And it was about two streets down from the real um, Jeremy house, uh, Jer Jeremy Marion's house. Yeah. And not that far from where you, you were living at the time, was it, Stephen? And, uh, and yeah, and she said, um, I used to be uh, Jeremy's... PA, in fact I was his PA for 21 years and uh, I raised Rupert, I helped raise Rupert and it's not a character we go into in great no. deep depth in our story no. but it was, um, it was incredible, she planted herself down on set like she sort of owned a bit of what we were up to <laughs> and uh, I could, you could see she was quite touched by you know, the, the transformation in Hugh looking so uncannily like Jeremy. Um, and we had that throughout, you know, when we would, went down to Devon, um, people were coming up and saying they were, you know, MPs and, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was a, it was a junior politician. Do you, do you remember the lady that we said, she was on the, the um, Liberal campaign trail and she brought a photo of herself. Um, oh, yes, yes. Into, yeah. Yes. I pretended to be nice to her. <laughs> was, <laughs> she will treasure that forever. <laughs> um, Stephen, how did you feel about having um, the former secretary on set? You know, having a, you know, a, somebody who knew him so well just there on your shoulder. I would have asked her if she'd arranged the conspiracy to murder. <laughs> I don't know. I actually didn't know she'd been on set. <laughs> I've noticed that... It's nobody... that forensic eye. <laughs> yeah, no, no, nobody tells me anything. <laughs> um, you, Stephen, you mentioned... to lunch. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about uh, Norman and how up now he'd been uh, sort of almost shadowy figure in the, in the tale of Jeremy Thorpe. Um, it was incredibly impactful to see him at the, at the very end. Was that always what you had in mind? Did you always intend to, to, to bleed through to the real Yes, the once real I met him in his house. And uh, yes, I suppose I thought of it there and then. I remember we drove away saying, we should have shot that then. Um, yeah, 
I think. I think he is the survivor. It, it, everyone else has passed away, and he is the great survivor of the story. And I can't imagine another note to end on, really. Yeah. And I think it's been cathartic for him. I think no one's well, heard him. No, no, he's no. been putting his hand up for so many years saying, this happened to me, and no one has believed him. And suddenly, with this story, he was, he was very wary when we first went down to see him. And at first, he didn't really want to talk about Jeremy Thorpe. And all the way through, he kind of maintained, oh, I, I hated Jeremy, and I didn't love him, and he didn't love me. And then when we went down to show him the episodes, when we got to the episode three, and that moment with Carmen and Jeremy, when Carmen says, why Norman? And Jeremy says, because I, he was the best. Norman, the real Norman broke down, like properly broke down. No, it wasn't, they weren't fake tears. He was properly broken and you, you put your arm around him and oh. he, it was cathartic. And I spoke to him, I speak to him a lot. He's love, I, I love him. Um, <laughs> Is he, it too much? Are you worried now? <laughs> Sometimes. Um, he, uh, I spoke to him last week and he said, uh, he said he's found it cathartic that finally he's been heard. And you said to me when we came out the edit uh, at the end, and you said, We've made him a little bit of a hero, this man yes, that no one's yeah, listened to. I would agree. Yeah. He's also got the best gossip in the world that you <laughs> oh, yeah. cannot possibly say your stories about those two famous <laughs> actresses having lesbian sex on board a plane. The aeroplane moves. Just, <laughs> just brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> God, I, I cannot <laughs> I, I, I want you to make it next, and I want one. Hugh to be in it, in a, in a master class. He himself, he himself contains the history of homosexuality and the change in the law, the change in attitudes. It's all expressed through him. He's so much a figure, uh, he's so much a figure from before uh, the, the law, ref the, before the law was reformed. He's so much a figure from the late 50s and early 60s, mm. and then to have got to here, it's all there, it's all in, it's all in him. And, and waiting that long to, to feel loved. To and to have been that out in the 60s. It's, I mean, that's where the damage yeah. comes from and that's where the heroism comes from. They're both the same thing in the end. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary act. And not, not out in Soho. You could be Quentin yeah. Crisp, I think, walking down the street in Soho. Well, that's hard work. But, um, Try but it in to Taunton. be in Devon, <laughs> yeah. sitting in a pub in Devon, being out and gay, that's tricky now, I would think. And uh, then, that's an extraordinary man. Truly extraordinary. Yeah. We, we actually have a clip, the Carmen clip that, that, that oh, you yeah. talked about. Let's, let's have a look at that. Why? I have a particular interest between you and me. I've been there with men. Before I was married, while I was married, next week. So I know what it's like. The stink of them, the sweat, the joy. So I wonder. Why a man with your power and privilege should choose him? Except I did not have a relationship with Norman Scott. Jeremy, I kept you off the witness stand to save your life. The prosecution had evidence. They had men from the pubs, men from the streets, men who know you. All of them liars. And I know those men. I know they last for one night. But with Norman Scott, it went on for years. It was different. You wrote to him. You helped him. You loved him. Why that man? Well, I would imagine. I can only speculate. If you do know those men, George, then you know those knights. <laughs> and you know how those knights can end. Touch me, dirty queer! Fuck! Touch me! Oh, no! Oh, take it! Take it! Just take it! <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. 
given those men. It may be, I suppose, one could imagine. But Norman Scott was the best. So good. It's beautiful, wonderful. Because what I love about that is just at that point in the drama, you get a sense of Jeremy's vulnerability, how he also has been party to abusive situations and had his own levels of, of damage. Um, this whole piece is a, a, a sort of meditation on, on power, and that's why I think it feels so incredibly relevant. Were you aware of that as you were working, that you were making, albeit a period piece, of something that had real contemporary bite to it? I don't well, honestly think so. Or I didn't. <laughs> I mean, um, people would say, oh, it's very relevant. And I thought, well, I, what, why? What is relevant about it? But I, I, I mean, I assume I'm wrong because it had such an impact. The relevance I've found, if one had to thrash around for an answer to your question, is... <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that, we're here for... Um, that is, yeah, that is our remit. Yeah. <laughs> is simply that um, a big part of Thorpe and of, of what he did was narcissism. And uh, in my, the last six years of my life, doing the whole hacked off thing and, and coming into contact with a lot, a lot of politicians all the time, um, it became very clear to me that, that whoever said it got it right when they said that politics is show business for the ugly. They are... Uh, <laughs> The egos and the narcissism amongst politicians mm. is as great, if not worse, than anything I've come across uh, in m show business. And, uh, and this was a great motivation of, uh, of thought, but it, it's absolute great white shark determination to get what you want, and mm. everything else falls by the wayside. Uh, and, and, it so, is. And, and I still see people like I, I still see people like that. You know, I mean, I, you can see it going on in politics right at this moment. But careers come first, and the country comes, you know, sixth or something. <laughs> and yeah, it is. I yeah. mean, I think you don't walk around on set going, "Is this relevant? Is this relevant?" Of it's course, just, of course. If it's good, it's relevant in the end. But in terms of the day we had our very first meeting about it, our first lunch. Uh, Keith Vaz had been exposed in Parliament as sleeping with rent boys by pretending to be a washing machine salesman. <laughs> 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 so it's just as mad as it ever was. And actually, you know, there's Jeremy Thorpe setting out to murder a man while holding on to power. Nowadays, they're holding on to power and murdering the entire fucking country. So it's like, it's a small bit compared to what's going on. It's well, yes, and it is, it is the sort of cabal of supposedly metropolitan elite and the, you know, sort of rural North Devon, sort of. <laughs> and once again, you know, those, we, we shouldn't be pitted against one another, but this, in, in, in this particular piece, feels like there's Jeremy in the countryside, and then there's Jeremy in the heart of power and in Westminster, where he, obviously, as you say, narcissistically wants to climb the greasy pole to prime ministership, uh, come what may, and will do anything to, to, to sort of kick people into touch you get into his, his way. Um, did you meet any resistance when you were making it? Um, were there any no-go areas where, where the script was... There were people sort of worried about the direction the script was taking? Well, um, no. Um, I mean, you have to be... It's interesting, that clip's interesting because, of course, you get fact-checked to death by the BBC. Um, you have to have three, two, three sources, sources of evidence yeah. for everything you do which I used to use with Stephen every time he wanted to do something. I'd go, no, the BBC won't allow that. I <laughs> often used to lie and just say, no, the BBC won't allow that. <laughs> and tell him, no, I can't do so that. So you are the great white shark. <laughs> I am. Believe but it's interesting because they do fact check you to death. But that scene, there is no evidence whatsoever for that scene. And I handed that scene to Dominic saying, you cannot tell me that scene didn't happen. I got no, no proof that it did. And, of course, it never actually happened like that, but that is the essence of it. That is who he was and who Carmen was as well. So, so in that sense, the BBC was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, maybe you kept fights from me, but... There was, did you? Were there, there lots was, of fights? There were some, some fights. I mean, we had an amazing commissioner, Lucy Richer, who's, like, the wisest person in drama, and she, uh, she kind of left us to our own devices, and, but we had to fight a little bit of editorial policy, 
There were some worries about the sex, the Vaseline scene. They, they worried a lot about it and said, oh, we're going to get complaints. That was my mum's favourite bit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what my mum took from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think we fought back on a lot of things. And so there, there was a lot of worry about complaints and we kept saying, no, complaints are good. Complaints are good. We don't want something bland. And, I think and this was again really about happened. the sex. You yeah. said that when it really happened, it, it's really happened. You can't argue with that. There was a moment we lost with the, the shaving of the back that we'd wanted to oh, do. Oh, yeah, there was one man who Norman worked for, and Norman used to shave his back, and he's still alive. Yes, and, we, and that's why you couldn't, you couldn't do the prove, same. You couldn't prove it. That but he shaved Stephen, his back. Stephen on the day, didn't he, Dad, tried to get a bathroom and tried to do it sneakily. Are you still livid you couldn't do that, Stephen? Well, it would have been a very good scene. Was a good it scene. would have been a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have What's to put a shaving my, someone's back scene in the my next film. <laughs> my lily-livered colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and what's so wrong with it? What's wrong with having your back shaved? No, it's filth. <laughs> <laughs> It's beyond Vaseline. That. The Vaseline I can tolerate, but the no, shaving. I'm very, very interested in your mother. You're interested in my mother. Did she seriously? That was her favourite bit. No, she she certainly was very, very, very in the moment during that scene. Um, but she a, no, I I. That I think was when his dad turned off. Yeah, that's when he said. Uh, my father had been very supportive, and he, he said to me, I, "I go and see him every Sunday night." And, that first Sunday on the night it was broadcast, he said, isn't, isn't your poof film on tonight? <laughs> he's ex-military and he's 89. And I said, yes, Dad, yes, yes. He said, well, we should watch it. I've got a television set upstairs. If you tell me how to turn it on, we'll watch it. Because he, <laughs> he doesn't watch telly. And so we went up to the attic, this dusty old thing, we turned it on. And he was very loyal. He said, I, I, I'm determined to support you always. And we got as far as Vaseline. And he said, you know, I'm really quite tired now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do you think he'll ever turn that television on again? Is that it now? It'll never go on. Uh, I doubt it. But he, yeah, he's great. He, he, he was the man in, who I took to the premiere of Paddington 2 and who said to me halfway through the film, is that a real bear? <laughs> <laughs> sort of want him to be a film critic for every publication in the UK. Yeah. Um, tonally, this, the, the, the films were fascinating because they were joyful to watch. There was a real sort of, almost like sort of picture postcard, sort of fun energy to them. And yet a, a dark, you know, a sort of dark sensibility also. How did you find that tone? How did you all work together to tread that, that tightrope? Well, that was in the 80s or 90s. When was the case? 70s. 70s. 80s, 70s. 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 That was the tone of the case. You know, schoolboys would make jokes of all that stuff about biting the pillow and um, shooting the dog. Schoolboys would make jokes about it. So it was, at the time, it was regarded as a great comedy. Perhaps more than, it was more as a comedy than as a tragedy. And I spoke to Richard Ingrams, who edited Private Eye for many, many years, and he said, which book are you doing? I said, John Preston's. He said, oh, that's the one that gets the tone right. Because the truth is, a lot of it was conducted in Private Eye. So it always had that air of a sort of entertainment going, being laid on for the nation. I don't know, or alternatively, you could say, well, I read the scripts, and that was the quality that they had. They were always very, very funny, and, um, and the darkness did, never seemed a problem. They didn't seem to clash at all. No, the more you all. banged them against each other, the more satisfying it was. And that's Russell's writing as well. Russell's writing yeah. is, it'll, you'll laugh one minute, and then it'll punch you in the gut the next. Yeah. And that's for, for, as producers, that helped us with crewing, with casting, everyone just accepted it. As soon as they got Russell's script, they just went, we have to do this. And all the crew... So often we don't have, you know, we don't have scripts when we start prep. And, and the difference with this project, unlike many other, shocking. was that the scripts Absolutely were in great, shocking. great shape when we all, when everyone was, so everyone was starting, everyone was on the same page. So all the, all the many people coming in the mix were able to get a very clear idea. Of, also all the crew on set would say, I've not had a script like this before. Everyone mm. was so excited. And uh, we got our first choices for all of our cast. Of course, we just yeah. would go to, be, and people were asking us. And I think Patricia Hodges' agent was just campaigning, going, come on, really? please. And she's what, 10 years older than you, Hugh, I think? <laughs> what, I switched Patricia off. Hodge, <laughs> 10, years, <laughs> 10 years older than you. Patricia Hodge, Hodge yeah, 10 well, years Well, yeah, older. I know, I know. You see, you're much too young to be my mother. <laughs> much too old to be her but son. But fabulous in that but role. But it was, it, she was amazing. Yeah, mm. yeah and brilliant. Played the piano for real as well. Um, but it was very easy to get the crew, to get the cast, and 
that was, it was the scripts. So and Russell, Russell, working with Russell, you'd say, right, I will deliver episode one at the end of January, episode two at the end of February, episode three at the end of March. And, and then you'd apologize and go, I'm two days late, I'm so sorry, and beat yourself up. But you could shoot them straight away. Straight away, they're, they're just the most fantastic scripts. So you only give them in once you've really, you've revised, you've done all your edits yourself. You, you are yeah, very happy. and then you get notes. You, you do sure. get notes, of, but yes, I think, I don't believe in that. It's a great theory abroad of draft zero that you hand in a script that's a rough piece of work ready for us all to begin let's all chip in and make this and see where we are it's like you sh i believe you should hand in something absolutely ready for transmission mm -hmm. and then you start work on it but yeah but you I mean, answered your question about why he was cast because he can do the jokes so the balance is already there in him yes and Murray Gold's music as well, bringing that in. I was going to say, yeah, Murray, Murray's music is absolutely brilliant. Because there's just, there's just a rolling joy to it. And you think, I'm going to sit there and it's, you know, it's, it's Sunday night, it's, it's going to be fun. And then, you know, you hit us with the, 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 the more serious stuff. I, actually wrote, I just remembered I wrote the whole thing <laughs> listen, listening to that waltz. It's, and I, the other day I looked it up, you know, you can go onto iTunes and see how many, it's an album of Hungarian waltzes that for some reason I thought that fits the show. And I looked on iTunes and I'd listened to it 491 times, the album. So that was constantly, when I'm writing, constantly, just on repeat, on repeat, repeat. And you mentioned... that music sums it up, I mean, exactly. And then Murray's music is even better. But, oh, um, his music is genius. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the back shaving scene. I don't want to go in. I know this upsets you, Stephen, but were there, were there any <laughs> other scenes that... The back shaving. We're not going to go back to the back shaving. But I was wondering oh, if there any other scenes... I'm all for it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know. I'm ready. I have a camera crew. At <laughs> <laughs> were there any other scenes that you had to cut because of various worries from controllers or editors? No, no. I don't think so. Episode, uh, no. Um, we had um, to... Um, um, tweak a few little bits about secretaries. Episode and three was a lot funnier originally. Yeah. I thought it was very broadly funny, and they made me say, "You've gone too far now. Pull that in." I was like, "All right," and uh, <laughs> it probably was better for pulling it in. But um, uh, yeah, I remember there was there was more sex in the very first draft I yeah. read. Yes, of course there was. Yes, <laughs> it made yes, me yes. fractionally nervous. Um, but it was damn funny. <laughs> yes, we actually went into I, the deed. I, yes. yes, I did the deed the first time with yes. Norman Scott, and I'm actually sort of banging away. While he's still chatting nervously about, about his... Yes, I think I saw stables as we came in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. That was a good thing. So, so you were just asked to sort of trim back some of the sort of the, the particularly the third app. That... Yeah, and you know, if if and if trimming that back would have ruined it, I would have fought my ground. But actually, it doesn't. The way that scene yeah. ends now is absolutely perfect. Um, and why only three episodes? I mean, with something as delicious as that, you know, with the, with, was there a temptation to roll it out over six or four? We talked about it a lot. It was yeah. either going to be four, never six. It was either going to be four or three. And it's just beginning, middle, and end. In the end, it's just I think. And I think sometimes nowadays everyone tries to pad things out and try and get sales, more episodes, more sales, yes, more yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do the and Bible in three hours. So yeah. this, this is a dog getting shot. Is that so your next project? Like, yeah. And Russell, you, Russell was firm about that. That yeah. actually just uh, keep it tight. Let's not have people watch and go, oh, well, episode three treads water a bit, and then four things. You know, we kept it very tight. And bearing in mind this has been sort of phenomenal success, is there any really, is there any really temptation to sort of you know, commit further scandals to, uh, to the public view. We're, we're working on one with Sarah Phelps, who does who uh, all the Agatha Christie's, who's amazing. A genius. It's a femi more feminist scandal about the first woman ever to be publicly slut-shamed. Uh, so uh, we're working on that one as well. But there's a, you've got to, it, this one's so good. Ooh. I mean, it's hard to find, you've got to match it as well. It's, it's, you've got, you don't want to do, to do something that's B plus. You want to make no, you've got to go straight for the, yeah. for, the, for the A or the 9, as it is in the, in the modern GCSE part. Good. John Stonehouse story is probably good, it, isn't that's it? That's good, but it's not as good. There's an amazing yeah. moment when he goes to the beach. Yeah, that's and, great. Yeah, yeah. And no one finds his clothes, and then he, he tries to fake his death. Hmm. No one notices, so he tries to do it again. Oh, really? That's <laughs> the fun, and that's, that's the oh, spirit of that's this. Good. That's good. But that's, that's, that's just the moment. That's the one off. There we are. We'll there do we that are. one as well. That's good. And are you tempted now, having had this great experience, Stephen, to, to go back to television more often? People wrote to me saying, why can't you do more television? And I thought, well, the, I didn't think the films were that bad, were they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> And then I thought, oh no, I see what they like is that you make films about England. Well, I, when I made Play for Today and all of that, there were these things called State of the Nation films, plays, whatever you call them. 
And I thought, oh, this is like that. It, it covers, you know, it goes to Devon, goes to Wales, does this and that. It's about the whole country, and that's rather interesting. And I can see that, um, you know, in 10 years' time, someone will make a great film about this complete cock-up that's going on, and, uh, but not for 10 years. That's how long it took before, we, before Peter wrote The Deal and The Queen. So in 10 years' time, book in for the Brexit film, because... <laughs> Although Jeremy Thorpe was a fervent European, wasn't he? He was Sorry? a sort of... He was a fervent European, yes. Well, when you were talking about the great white shark, I thought, well, that's a description of Boris. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not waiting for the three-part drama series about Boris, though. I'm not going <laughs> well, to steer clear, maybe. Well, come on, it is the most extraordinary story going on. Are you Absolutely. tempted by that, Dominic? Are you going to... Three parter on the on Bojo. No, no ten years. Ten, ten years. Yeah, because there's stuff with there's stuff going on we don't know about. There's a lot we don't know about. And in ten years' time, we'll get the true story. And if it could end in his death, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, um, but I predict I'm going to make a very interesting point. One of many that uh, <laughs> it will be hard to make harder, much harder to make dramas or films, television about. Uh, for instance, Brexit, something, things that happen now, because so much of what happens uh, in this Brexit scandal happens online, happens on social media, happens on the internet, and no one's really cracked how to make that mm. filmy or, or even televisual. Yeah. You know, what do you do? Keep cutting to a little screen? Um, I, I've never seen anyone crack that. And no. I, it's, I think it's one of the reasons why, again and again, uh, people respond well to films, television things made in the pre-internet age, uh, even pre-cell phones pretty good. There's something even a bit dreary about, you know, you can solve, you're a screenwriter, any problem, but he picks up his phone, phone and calls her and it's, it all goes a bit, just vaguely, fractionally dead. Mm. Yes. Um, anyway, perhaps it wasn't so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what, is your, what is your next venture, Hugh? Can you, can you say what your next role is going to be? Well, I don't know. I, I... <laughs> You're obviously looking forward to it, which is the main yeah, thing. I, <laughs> I, I've always hated my job, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just... What I like to do is to toy with various projects and producers like a cat with a half-dead mouse. <laughs> and uh, ah, just bring them in and then bat them around the floor a bit and then throw them out again. And... Um, <laughs> I'm doing that with several projects at the moment. <laughs> well, don't wait for but me, dear. Yeah. I'm unemployed. <laughs> well, uh, Stephen needs a job. Oh, do, uh, yeah. Stephen, well, the, surely this could be your third <laughs> collaboration in the, in the offing. No, oh. I'm unemployed. There's not a lot of enthusiasm for that collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Bond. James Bond. Bond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bond. come on, Stephen. Come on, Stephen. Would you do it, Stephen? Would you do come. James Bond? Come on. The time's come. I think so. Start a I once wanted to have a debate with Danny Boyle, who was when he was asked to do the, f the film about Steve Jobs. I saw it. I knew nothing about Steve Jobs, and I came out knowing even less. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to have a debate in which I said to him, why did you not say to the producers, are you out of your fucking minds? And he thought that was rather a good idea. So actually, I'm full of admiration for Danny because he worked it out. He clearly... I mean, he could, see, he could actually see the bullets speeding towards him. So I think they all dodge speeding bullets. So I take it from that, you won't be, you won't be helming no, the next... And... Oh, you are available. <laughs> <laughs> I would so love to see that happen now. Um, we talked obviously about casting, and we focused naturally on you, Hugh, but um, was, you said you got your first choice. It's Ben Whishaw. Let's, it would feel remiss not to talk about Ben's performance. Yeah. Um, what I loved about it, there was, there, was just a, there was a relish to it that obviously fitted the piece, but it felt quite old-school camp without being mocking or grotesque, if you know what I mean. Is, does that seem sort of fair to you, Russell? It was brilliant. It was very clever and very precise. He met yeah. Norman as well, but again, didn't do an impersonation of him, just kind of got a bit of the essence of him and and it changes over the years as well it's very clever because yeah. it's actually normal from the 60s it's a big it's the most important 20 years of your life really the, the, yeah. and, and 30 to 50 where you become yourself and um it, it's much gayer and more openly flamboyant in the 70s yeah. towards the end very clever he's what a lovely man gorgeous sadly he didn't want to go out with me <laughs> <laughs> what's the point 
<laughs> and then he met, he met Norman once, didn't he? It was only, only one meeting, but in, uncannily, you know, he picked up some of his, his mannerisms and his, yeah. sort of met. Yeah, they're very florid, his hand, all his hand gestures. Yeah. Well, we, we had Hugh, Ben and Alex Jennings. Alex Jennings. Before, yeah, before, we, uh, before we got a casting director, actually, we had those three in place. They were there, ready. And then Patricia Hodge banging in the door. God, that is a, what a triumvirate. And Monica um, Dolan as well. Was Monica Dolan, Monica Dolan. No, they're, they're, everyone was impeccable. I'm just looking at this screen, just for some audience questions. I can see the, the clock ticking down. Um, as Ben's not here to defend himself, can you tell us the funniest anecdote about him on set? I mean, let's face it, it doesn't even have to be real at this juncture. He doesn't make up. He, he's not around to... I'd, know, actually, to I'd actually never seen Ben act because I don't watch television, so... That's why I'm unemployed. <laughs> um, but he is in Bond. But yeah. I, it, well, I haven't seen Bond. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get that job, Earl. <laughs> You've never seen a Bond film. No, I've seen Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> you are right up to speed, my friend. <laughs> I think Ben had probably mentioned the dogs. You know, we went through. The but um, yes. dogs. That, that I then a... saw Ben in a play at the Almeida, <laughs> and uh, I thought I thought I'd better find out about this chap. So I went to see him in this play, which wasn't brilliant. And he was playing a very... Um... <laughs> Am I getting deeper and deeper? Should I stop thinking? <laughs> he was playing a very stiff, stiff American. And I thought, my God, you've got three days between finishing this play and starting, starting with us, so what do I do? I then thought, I'll invite him to lunch with Norman. So. Norman came up to London, which I think was the first time he'd done that for 40 years or something. And uh, Ben sat there, and Norman started to talk, and Ben's eyes were out on stalks. And I just said, well, that's who you're playing, and I'll see you at the premiere. <laughs> <laughs> His eyes were out on stalks. You're very hands-on, Stephen, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and Ben, incredibly, I mean, he'd come from a play, you know, he'd come straight to us from... Um, you know, what was tough with Ben is getting him prepped for the, yeah. for the role because un unlike Hugh, he didn't have any availability sort of r running up to it. So all the makeup tests and all of that, they fitted in in the evenings around his, um, around his plays. And but, then a great uh, dane that he had to wrangle oh, through dame. over 50% of his scenes. F five of them. I mean, four, we went four, through four or five. Yeah, four. Four different great danes. Yes. Then someone said to me, oh, great danes are famously stupid. <laughs> And if they don't want to go somewhere, famously quite heavy to drag. Yes, and then they would say, oh, they don't like the dark, or they don't like the rain. <laughs> so they're not that stupid. <laughs> they're they're well, wiser than we are. But I think the most memorable difficulty was the fact we, we had the, the scene where um, Norman's walking the great dame for the, his great dame for the first time, and he bumps into... Um, Michelle Dutrice's character with her Great Dane and, and the animal handler turned up, you know, they, they'd have this brief for quite some time but I guess, you know, you, you can't really second, second guess what the dog's going to do but the, the dogs had attacked each other that morning so we had to do the scene with the two Great Danes as a, it was a sort of split screen thing, wasn't really? it? They couldn't appear together. Yeah, they couldn't appear. It was, so the they master, had an artistic tantrum, <laughs> they, whereas the rest of the cast yeah, was the one, quite The one went for the other one. Yeah. It was in their contracts. It was in their contracts. Yeah. Yeah. And this show's also had a huge success in America as well. I mean, what is a very, a very English story and scandal has uh, played very nicely over there. With the number two show on Amazon, apparently. But we, they're all so, everything's so clouded in secrecy. Yeah. We've been told that after Goliath, which is one of their own shows, tax, which is lovely. Tax it, dodgers. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so the, the algorithm, the secret algorithms have revealed it to Amazon. Oh. <laughs> you sell your soul in this job. <laughs> what you um, why do you think uh, the story about corruption at the heart of power has pl played so well in America? <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> but they've lapped it up. I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I, I suspect that Americans think that this is how we live all the time. This kind of, you know, that we the sort of old cars puttering around the countryside and lots of sort of <laughs> saucy Vaseline sex. <laughs> God, I hope we've not lost that. I really. <laughs> <laughs> um, tax dodge notwithstanding, allegedly, what was it like to work with them as, as, as partners? Did you find them a great, uh, good partnership? They were lovely. They, were, they kind of left us to it as well. Really? Everyone kind of left us alone. I think because everyone's slightly scared of Stephen and Russell. That they, they just said, get on with it, um, which was great. Look at him, very benign. Stephen, would you describe yourself as frightening? No, I'm hands-on. 
<laughs> Very hot time. Is hands on a good thing or a bad well, thing? Well, no, I meant it. I meant it. Well, no, I mean, it can be a very bad thing, Stephen, but I'm not implying that. In, <laughs> I mean, not implying that. What I meant to say was when you said, when you said to Ben, you're playing that character, I'll see you in three days' time, I meant it slightly ironically. And that actually, there's a degree of laissez faire in what you do. I don't think that's a bad thing at well, all. Well, he's quite good in the film, isn't he? He's extremely good <laughs> so in the film. What's the problem? No problem. <laughs> So the, first, the first time I worked with Stephen on, on Florence Foster Jenkins, uh, I was terrified. And I always assumed, you know, Stephen Frears would be very much, you know, detailed notes and uh, agonising about yeah. character and plot and everything. So, oh, Christ. And we organised to have a cup of tea and I went along with 20 really interesting questions about the script and the character. And to each one, Stephen said, I don't know, no idea. <laughs> But then you were very good. <laughs> I don't quite know what crime I've committed. So it, I sound like the, the policeman at Hillsborough. So is, is, that, is that your MO then? You just you pick people who are very good I and then pick, you just no, get I out of the way? I pick people who are right for the part. And how involved were you in the casting? I mean, we, 100%. You talk, so you picked you. You thought, right, he's the guy. Well, I did actually, didn't I? I okay. think historically I did. By that I mean I said, oh, I think Hugh's a good idea. Something as inspired as that. <laughs> and it, it, what, what, what Stephen, you have to understand, is um, I would describe, it, describe him as an idiot savant. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in that he... <laughs> this has become a roast, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time. He's the reverse. He's the reverse of what I expected, which yes. was this sort of 1960s, 70s, you know, let's talk about character and plot and really yeah. uh, all that exhausting stuff and lovely stuff. And um, he's the reverse. And it, what he does is he's got a, a this sort of set of instincts for that's a good script, that's good casting, that's a great DP, that's a great writer, and then lets it all happen and sits there and uh, I think you... Go to sleep. Well, you do do that. <laughs> A lot of sleeping. Uh, <laughs> phone goes off all the way through. Oh, takes, does it? Okay. All the time, all the time. It's usually Judy Dench. Or well. it might be Helen Mirren. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have you have you sort of butt dialing Helen Mirren in the middle of your shooting. More or less. <laughs> but he takes the call. <laughs> oh, that's so rude. Well, Helen might be more so interesting rude. than you. Yeah. Well, it's like the Russian roulette. Like we're just about to start a take, and Stephen will be finishing a text sends and then we go for action and so all the way through the, the take and there were some long scenes you're, you're just hoping that there's not going to be a reply and I'm that a grandee of British theatre <laughs> doesn't <laughs> take the back <laughs> so how do you answer that Stephen I feel you should have the right to reply are answer you what? to the fact you're constantly on the phone when you're supposed to be directing well they might be more interesting things going on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's savage he was giving his all <laughs> no he can he can be savage there was a scene in Florence Foster Jenkins which we were, you know, it was time to shoot it and we went in to do the, the line-up in the afternoon and frankly it was marvellous. And uh, <laughs> Stephen's reaction, and he was having a very bad day, was, it was very, very boring, let's cut it. <laughs> and uh, you can get that sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm just not interested, let's cut it, let's cut the whole scene. And uh, I remember having to fight very hard for that one. As, uh, but you know, you, did you, you win? most of the time you just need feeding. If you give him a bun, he's all right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't hear any complaints. <laughs> I don't think anyone is complaining. Um, I'm not sure if the festival app is working. Do we have a definitive uh, yes or no on that? Is it working? I was trying to see the screen. Is... Somebody has said here uh, that they have their 10-year-old and 7-year-old next-door neighbours' boys um, had guinea pigs called Jeremy and Norman. <laughs> that, that's come in. That's... <laughs> Thank you so much. For... You give and you give and you give. The it's not even place. a question, it's a statement. <laughs> it's just, it's just posted a statement about the next door neighbour's pets. <laughs> what are these Who was children that? grown up to Who be? Was there is no. There, there's, we can't find out who that is. Anyone going to admit to that? Is everyone going to put their hands up and have. Lovely! Oh, Was so... there a question to go with the rodent <laughs> marginalia? <laughs> Not really. 
So we've assembled some of the greatest luminaries of stage and screen. <laughs> Rather than ask you a question. <laughs> OK. <coughs> Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question before I wrap things up? I think we're going to go old school with hands in the air. Yes. So do you want to shout? Oh, the Thorpe oh. wardrobe. Yeah. G is that ginger or camel, sir? <laughs> it's ginger. Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. We can talk about the, the, the deepest political and sexual scandal of the last 50 years. But my God, sir, it's a ginger coat. Um, <laughs> all right, so you're right, though, uh, because it's, it's, it's panoramically exquisite, this production, and we've talked about, obviously, the contribution these guys have made and the, the, uh, the composer, Murray Gold. Let's talk about the wardrobe. So let's name the... Who, who did Suzanne you all... Cave. Suzanne Cave was our fantastic costume designer, and she came on board um, very early on, yep. um, again, as with our other um, heads of the department. I think it was um, quite a gift for any costume designer to come on board, because you've effectively got two guys from very different worlds going through eras that were quite defining in fashion mm. in, in many senses. Jeremy, well, yeah, Hugh, you spent a long time with... Uh... I wasn't sure. Are you complaining about the ginger coat? No. Oh, brilliant. Lovely. Good. Oh, I thought that was a complaint. No. <laughs> I think it was just a very vociferous affirmation. It's gorgeous. The hat, the hat was from... The actual tailors, uh, the actual hat makers, wasn't it? That uh, yeah. was it. That thought we yeah, they were. Yes, and it never fitted. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I would say even in that shot, it's too small, and it's still a source of anger to me that uh, <laughs> I had to wear a too small hat. Did Jeremy the wear them anything. too small though? Was that, that the, was the gig? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to kill someone. <laughs> Perhaps that was, <laughs> it was it. My hat. Yeah, but it would occasionally look like Arthur Daly. <laughs> no, I know. And you depressed me massively after the first day by saying. You came into the makeup trailer, which you never do, and my heart was in my mouth. And all you said was, you look a bit like Arthur Daly. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me several days to recover. Uh, See, but it is a, but it, it, well, your question or your statement, your observation, is a cue to say, in my opinion, uh, I can't bear small budgets. I'm used to enormous ones. But um, <laughs> th this... <laughs> What they did, what, uh, what was done on this show with really a very modest budget, particularly next to something like The Crown, I mean, a fractional of, of that uh, budget, is quite amazing. You know, mm. Suzanne Cave with the, the costumes, Daniel Phillips with the makeup, who frankly is 99% of my performance is what he did to my face. Uh, and the DP, uh, Danny Cohen, and the, the operator, Ian, what's it? What is Ian's second name? Mackay, Hugh. Mackay. Mackay. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, because they, sometimes out of necessity they have to shoot in funny ways because there's very little set, because uh, we couldn't afford much set. And anyway, I, uh, having not done telly uh, for a very long time, was amazed at how brilliant it, it all looks and how, uh, what, a, what a world was created out of, uh, from a shoestring. I am duty-bound to say to any drama makers out there, that was a big budget. Is it? Yes. <laughs> Quite big. <laughs> That's as best as it I gets you. <laughs> <laughs> Has that resolved your ginger coat queries? Right. Did you get to keep the wardrobe? Still on the you were persistent with the <laughs> Very strong sartorial bias towards these questions. Did you get to keep the coat? That's our last question. Uh, I believe it's in my contract somewhere. I haven't really looked at it. I think I can. But if, if you want it th that badly... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it does feel like it's all heading in that direction, doesn't no, it? <laughs> Just sort of go. Um, will you please join me in uh, thanking our fabulous panellists for this fabulous, fabulous piece of television. Thank you, Thank you Darren.